I'd like to thank Middle East, uh, Middle East Monitor for arranging this event and inviting us all uh, to talk about a community that is too often overlooked when we talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict. I, what, what I was interested, I was intrigued by Oren's new stratification. I hadn't seen it before, and I wondered where I might fit in it, um, having a foot both in the coloured camp and in the grey camp, it seemed to me. I don't know what colour that makes me. <laughs> um, now, as a journalist, uh, I'm, I tend to deal in broad brush strokes, um, so I've, I'm going to paint a fairly broad picture of how I see the basic law, and um, that inevitably means I'm going to cover some of the ground, I think, that we saw in the first panel. I apologise for that, but I hope I'm offering uh, an anal analytical framework that will be of some help to, to some of you. Um, the basic law that passed last summer... Uh, defining Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people has attracted severe criticism um, from foreign governments, although not se severe enough as, as we, we saw, um, from liberal Israeli and American Jews, and also, of course, from representatives of Israel's large Palestinian minority who called it an apartheid law. The, the law's main point is to declare that the land of Israel, and it's left intentionally unclear what territory that encompasses, belongs exclusively to all Jewish people around the world. In other words, Israeli citizenship counts for far less than membership of the Jewish people, who are considered collectively to be the true stakeholders of the State of Israel. Even so, the Palestinian minority's reaction to the law has been generally relatively mute, Apart, that is, from sections of Israel's small Druze community, which is drafted into the army. The Druze have long been told, um, falsely of course, that they enjoy a so-called blood covenant with the Jewish people. The ambivalence, if far from indifference, of Palestinian citizens towards the nation-state basic law tells us something about the community's difficulties in responding to it, especially when the framing of the debate is being controlled by outside parties. Stating that the law makes Palestinian, the Palestinian minority second-class citizens or risks turning Israel into an apartheid state can easily become a trap. It suggests that Israel was a normal Western-style liberal democracy before the law. It implies that the new law is a perversion of Israel's long-standing democratic bona fides and one imposed by the Netanyahu right. But as we shall see, the law is chiefly, in my view anyway, declarative, declarative. It changes very little in terms of the way that Israel was constitutionally set up. Israel was in fact established as an apartheid state, and by the so-called good guys, the socialists of the Israeli Liberal Party, uh, Labour Party, sorry. It's revealing to hear that the main grounds on which the Israeli and American Jewish liberals who have opposed the nation state law, how they set out the grounds for their opposition, the Haaretz newspaper called the legislation completely redundant, while Abraham Foxman, the head of the New York-based Anti-Defamation League, labelled it well-meaning but unnecessary. The nation-state law is in fact a useful way to gauge the key differences between the so-called Zionist left and the Zionist right. The Israeli Labour Party understood that the apartheid system it had created uh, at Israel's founding was shameful and needed to be veiled, both from outsiders and from Israel's own Jewish public. The right, on the other hand, cares very little what you or I think of the law. In this sense, the basic law may have done us a favour. It makes it clearer what kind of state Israel is. I want to set out four main areas in which the law frames the Jewish state's relationship to its 1.8 million Palestinian citizens, and I want to focus strictly on, on Palestinian citizens rather than broader issues. Three of those four areas, I will argue, offer no substantive change. Fourth, which has been less discussed, hints, although Oren did, did, did refer to this, hints of where Israel is heading next in relation to Palestinian citizens. The first area relates to largely symbolic issues, ensuring the exclusively Jewish content uh, of national memorial days, the flag, the national anthem, the weekly day of rest and the calendar. 
The fifth of Israel's population who are Palestinian have always been excluded from the state symbolic sphere. The law simply restates the historic reality facing Palestinian citizens. The second area concerns language. Hebrew is given primacy, and Arabic downgraded from the position of a state language it enjoyed under the British to a merely a special status. Because this is a formal legal change of status, it is the one that has been most commonly publicised by the foreign media when discussing the law. However, in practice, this downgrade changes very little either. Arabic has inferior status uh, from the moment of Israel's birth. Many state institutions offer no Arabic services or very inferior ones, from public museums and the courts to government websites and the tax office. We should also remember that Israel has exploited the different mother tongues of Jewish and Palestinian citizens to justify completely segregated state education in Israel. There's a Hebrew language system for Jews and a highly inferior Arabic language system for Palestinian citizens. The latter system is massively underfunded. Jewish officials control the curriculum of these Arab schools and the Israeli security services have historically operated spies and collaborators in the classrooms, both among teachers and pupils. Language is offered a pretext for keeping Jewish and Palestinian citizens and children apart during their formative years as a way to cultivate and perpetuate suspicion and fear among the Jewish majority. The third area concerns the connections between Israel and the so-called Jewish diaspora. According to the nation-state law, the Jewish people enjoy an exclusive right to immigrate to Israel as part of a supposed ingathering of the exiles. They have a unique right to national self-determination, as Joseph mentioned, in, the, uh, in Israel. And the Israeli state reserves for itself a right to interfere in the affairs of Jews overseas as their representative to preserve their cultural, historical and religious heritage. Again, there's nothing new here. Israel never signed severed ties to the Jewish populations overseas. In fact, it has always presented itself as their protector and representative. Reciprocally, these non-state organisations enjoy state-like powers. The Jewish National Fund owns 13% of Israel's territory, which it holds exclusively on behalf of the Jewish people, not Israeli citizens. The Jewish Agency helps both to oversee immigration to Israel and to determine who is allowed access to Israel's, most of Israel's land through vetting committees. The World Zionist Organisation, meanwhile, pumps money into Jewish settlements in the occupied territories. On the issue of immigration, founding legislation like the 1950 Law of Return has always given Jews an exclusive national right to come to Israel and receive automatic citizenship. The 1952 Citizenship Law, by contrast, strips the vast majority of Palestinians, those expelled during the Nakba of 1948 and all their descendants, of any right ever to return to their lands. In fact, it would be better to term it uh, an anti-citizenship law. The citizenship law means that Palestinian citizens have no possibility to gain residency or citizenship for their relatives living outside Israel, including those expelled in 1948 during the Nakba. An amendment since 2003 means additionally that Palestinian citizens cannot marry and live in Israel with a Palestinian spouse from the occupied territories. Israel has also separated the legal concept of citizenship from that of nationality as a further way to entrench and institutionalise discrimination in ways to strengthen uh, the diaspora's ties to Israel at the expense of Palestinian citizens. Israeli citizens have been divided into Jewish and Arab nationalities to create this separation of rights, whereas all Israeli citizens are entitled, at least in theory, to liberal democratic style citizenship rights, only Jews, including those outside Israel, are entitled to national rights in Israel. If a Palestinian's right as a citizen conflicts with the Jewish people's national rights, then Jewish national rights take precedence. The most significant of these national rights relates to land. Israel has nationalized 93% of its territory, almost all of it, not for its citizens, but for the Jewish people globally. The land is effectively held in trust by state institutions on behalf of Jews everywhere, whether they live in Israel or not, or whether they are Zionists or not. This is a core principle of Zionism, a policy of Judaization, bringing territory and other key resources under exclusive Jewish control. In practice, Judaization is achieved and access to land restricted through admissions committees operating in many hundreds of rural communities in Israel. 
These communities vet those who wish to live on most of Israel's nationalized land using social suitability as a rationale for excluding Palestinian citizens. This is the main way that a system of residential apartheid is enforced. However, there is one loophole to Jewish control over land. Towns and cities do not have admissions committees, which leads us to the fourth area of the nation-state law. The relevant section reads, the state views the development of Jewish settlement as a national value and shall act to encourage and promote its establishment and strengthening. This again is chiefly a restatement of the existing situation. However, an earlier version of the law was more explicit and I think it gives us a clue as to where Israel is heading next. It called for the development of communities separated on the basis of religion or nationality. This is part of a backlash by the right to Israel's growing struggle to contain Palestinian citizens in the tightly delimited ghettos created for them and thereby complete the Judaization process. Palestinian citizens are suffocating under Israel's residential apartheid system and severe planning restrictions. Their 120 or so designated communities, those are the ones that are recognized, effectively Palestinian reservations, have run out of land for development. Meanwhile, Israel has built no new community for Palestinian citizens in 71 years. Tens of thousands of Palestinian homes in Israel are illegal and under threat of demolition. The question is, how can Palestinians escape these ghettos? Israel's rural Jewish communities are off limits because of the admissions committees, but the towns and cities have no formal way of barring Palestinian citizens, apart from the reluctance of Israeli Jews to sell to them, and Palestinians' traditional reticence to unmoor themselves from their historic communities and the partial security they offer against Israeli racism. But deprived of housing options, residents of Nazareth have in recent years been at the forefront of those seeking to move to nearby Jewish cities. They may already be a third of the population in neighbouring Nazareth elite, a city established back in the 1950s to Judaise Nazareth using new Jewish immigrants. Fearing its Judaization role is being subverted, Nazareth elite has responded by trying to deter more Nazareth residents moving into the Jewish city. Recently, that has included work on building a large ultra-Orthodox neighborhood of extremist religious Jews, presumably to make the city less inviting to Palestinian citizens. But Nazareth families are now seeking other options, such as moving into newly constructed neighborhoods of the secular Jewish city of Afula, only minutes drive away. Over the past three years, there have been major protests by Afula's residents and officials to stop what they see as a takeover. In practice, just a handful of non-Jewish families trying to move in. Banners at a protest last year after someone sold to a Palestinian family read, traitors against the Jews will find no rest. The city's deputy mayor, Shlomo Malhi, uh, explained to journalists what was at stake. I hope that the house sale will be cancelled so that this city won't be, begin to be mixed. We do not have admissions committees like in the communities around us, but we will not allow the character of the city to change. In conclusion, the reason the nation-state law has changed so little in practice is because Israel had already been established as an apartheid state for its Palestinian citizens. The law was, as liberals rightly complained, largely redundant. One battlefront remains, however, to enforce racial segregation in the towns and cities. The right wishes to tear off the mask of Israel's veiled apartheid system to make it explicit, so these Judaized urban spaces can, 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 can continue to be protected from the country's Palestinian cities, citizens. For the first time, Israel is prepared to go public with its version of apartheid. For the first time, Israel is willing to risk looking like the much discredited model of white era South Africa. Thank you.